Good morning, everyone. some hope chain to addiction cause you cannot go hey you are you begging for some peace those feelings of guilt seem to never cease i know the bondage that you're in the bible calls it sin there's only one way out and that is through christ jesus sweet jesus who can set you free and give you life as he did for me he's the one who can save your soul heal the wounds and make you whole jesus sweet jesus hey you are you trying to find joy trouble with depression you're its little toy hey you are you searching for a way Living with no purpose each and every day I know the bondage that you're in My Bible calls it sin There's only one way out And that is through Christ Jesus Sweet Jesus He's the one who can set you free And give you life as he did for me He's the one who can save your soul, heal the wounds, and make you whole. Jesus, sweet Jesus, He loves you, He'll help you, and take you as you are. He's mighty and lovely, the bright morning star. He loves you, He'll help you. And take you as you are He's mighty and lovely The bright morning star Oh Jesus Sweet Jesus Yeah Jesus Oh hey you Have you lived a life of crime Ran with a gang and now you're doing time Hey you it's sex, the drug you crave It's ruined your life And now you're lusting for the grave I know The bondage that you're in The Bible calls it sin There's only one way out And that is through Christ Jesus Sweet Jesus He's the one who can set you free And give you life as he did for me He's the one who can save your soul Heal the wounds and make you whole Jesus Sweet Jesus Yeah Jesus Sweet Jesus Okay, gonna play another one, which I wrote in a while back. Let's see if I can find it here. Okay, good. It's called Real Love. Time, the season for love and romance. Men and women come together to join in the dance, holding hands and giving kisses and sharing their vows of love toward each other. But I wonder. Love for me 
But I look in the word and read of God's own love for me, where He gave His own Son to suffer and die for me, His enemy. That's real love, and I know that there's love for me. It's plain to see at the. Searching for love Never knowing Something greater has come From above To give them comfort Fill the hole In all of their hearts I hope Only God can fill And I want them to know of Him To look In the way own love for them where he gave his own son to suffer and die for them his enemies that's real love and I know that there's love for them it's plain to see at the If you're lonely, feel forsaken and filled with despair Listen to me when I tell you there's one who does care The God of heaven who created you and this world Has sent his one and only son to show you what love is about so look in the word and read of God's own love for you Where he gave his own son to suffer and die for you His enemy, that's real love Do you know that there's love for you? It's plain to see at the cross There is love for those For those who feel they're left out Oh, there is love for you Whoever you are Real, real love Okay, I'll be right back. Just hang up this guitar. All right, good morning again. I'm back and uh, glad to have you all with us. Could you turn your Bibles to the Epistle of Jude? Go to Jude verse 1. Jude verse 1, and we're going to be uh, continuing our study of the uh, Jude verse 7 today. And um, we'll be looking at the three par causal participial clauses that are found in this verse. So that's our subject today. And uh, we're continuing to uh, deal with this fantastic uh, epistle, this tiny little book. And it has so many uh, different crazy things in it, wild things in it. And, um, you know, it's, we've talked about it's the most neglected uh, book in Bible studies, whether it's scholarly, biblical studies, or in the pulpit with pastors, and also the most misinterpreted uh, epistle as well. And uh, I was just working on a textual 
uh, uh, textual criticism problem with verses 22 and 23 of this epistle, which is absolutely bizarro, <laughs> very difficult. And so I just that was I've been working on that for the last couple of days, and uh, so uh, but it's it's a great epistle and uh, it's a great challenge to uh, as an interpreter. So. I'm really uh, hoping and praying, actually, that uh, if this study will be a great blessing in the body of Christ because, as I've been bringing out, it's got a great application, this particular epistle. And uh, so uh, that's uh, today. Uh, to also, because uh, it's Sunday, I usually like to do announce some announcements. So uh, for, the, for the people who are, are uh, unfamiliar, unfamiliar with our ministry, because we have a lot of people popping in to our websites and podcasts that we have and uh, various media platforms that, and YouTube, and uh, so we get new people all the time listening or watching to us. So watching us. So uh, and there's also, of course, the regular crowd that uh, follows along. And uh, we do have a regular. People ask me how, how big is how big is you know the people group of people that are following you. I have no clue. I just know that um, if you look at our hits on our website, the Wenstrom.org site, just that, um, quite significant. I, I because we have like for instance we did. And we did Habakkuk and Haggai, First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, and the Doctrine of Prayer. Last three years, okay, like the the number of hits is like in the triple digits, and sometimes four thousand, you know, over a thousand hits on on each these individually these classes individually. And if you want to go back to when I was in, you know, in uh, Marion, Iowa, it's a uh, they're in the like Colossians series, Zephaniah. They're in the thousands, the number of people hitting our website for these lessons. And a thousand, we're not saying. Each individual class has over a thousand hits on it, so that's I don't have no idea who these people are, but um, I know there's I know that of course there's there's uh, search engines like Google and, and Bing that that you know hit, but that that's not that's not you can't account uh, that's not uh, that's not it's small percentage really, and uh, so anyways um, so then we have the podcast now and uh, on face uh, iTunes Spotify Amazon Music we got the Faith Live Sermon site where we put all our MP3 MP4s. Um, now and uh, so we got you know quite a bit of uh, exposure out there in the internet. So uh, keep it in prayer. So um, for the, for those who are unfamiliar, our ministry are we're an expository type ministry. My name is Bill Wench. I'm a pastor ordained in 1998 at Grace Bible Church in Somerset, Massachusetts. I uh, left there for my first church plant in uh, 2001 uh, of um, August of 2001. I went to Iowa. I was in the East uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa area. Uh, the first church plant, I think, was we were in Norway, Iowa, and then the second one was in Marion, Iowa, and uh, so um, we. And then I came back to Massachusetts in 2019 of June um, because uh, to, to help my dad out with my mother who has dementia, and uh, she since is in the nursing home for the last year or so. My dad is taking it's a little bit. He's adjusted to the fact that uh, as best you can with her not being around. So. Um, I, 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 I believe the Lord's going to have me leaving soon because I, uh, so we'll see what happens. But, uh, um, and also, uh, so we're, we're an expository type ministry. That means we go through the different books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, book by book. We alternate, try to alternate between Old Testament and New Testament. And uh, also, we all of our classes are recorded video and audio. Uh, we use uh, YouTube streaming video uh, for our live broadcast. We, we have a YouTube page to search for me under Wenstrom Bible Ministry, uh, Bill Wenstrom, Google me. Or you can go to the very bottom of our homepage at wenstrom.org and you'll see the YouTube insignia. Click on that. We have a Facebook page as well, Wenstrom Bible Ministries. Uh, we have, again, spot podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, pod Amazon Music Podcasts. Search for us under Wenstrom Bible Ministries. We have over 2,000 now podcasts up there on each of those sites, uh, thanks to Faith Life Sermons. And also, um, we uh, our, our MP3 and MP4 recordings or on our web, or on are now on our Faith Life Sermon site since August of 2019. Prior to that, all of our MP3 before recordings were on the Wenstrom.org site, and we were also um, we are also uh, have a lot of over 1,700 written articles on our website, uh, the exegesis and exposition uh, in exhaustive detail of the different books we've done over the last over 20 years now, and also I do various theological subjects, and uh, you go to our written library on our main site, you'll see. Uh, written library, and you'll see doctrines, and it's broken out in the systematic various areas of uh, theology, pneumatology, paterology, eschatology, whatnot, ecclesiology, and uh, also we have a lot of um, our, you know articles in PDF format. They're all in PDF format on a Winstrom.org site, but we also have a lot of things on different uh, figures in the Bible, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. And uh, also Greek word studies, and uh, which are pretty popular. I just flipped them up there because they were 
part of my study when I did Philippians. And uh, so, uh, anyways, uh, and then I th then um, also we have a, another website where we put a lot over we have over seven hundred uh, written articles on it, Academy Edu. So just Google me under Bill Wenstrom and you'll see the Academy Edu website, which is very very popular. Where I guess I'm very it's very gratifying. It's in. Uh, and I get to, they, people message you and uh, when you're downloading your stuff and they can do that. And it's really cool. I met some really, really great people. And uh, so um, we have, we're in the top 1% of hit uh, people of views. We have over 725,000 views. And uh, we're also, we have like uh, almost 800 followers now on Academia EDU, and I've only been on it since 2017. The funny thing is I wasn't even, <laughs> I don't even know if I was, I was like, ah, I'll put my articles up there. I mean, maybe somebody will read them. <laughs> and sometimes I was like, when I came out to Massachusetts, when I moved here in Massachusetts 2019, it just went through the roof. So God's using that, and I'm thankful for that. And um, so um, that's uh, where, uh, that's who we are. And um, we also have, uh, I write my own Christian music, and I've done so for years, and I'm, I'm ready, I'm, about ready to get ready to write another collection of songs. Each collection of songs, I, I like to put 14, a collection of songs for 14. And um, so the, the last one I did was at the, at, uh, at the end of 2019 when I was in Iowa, and it's called Rejoice. All of them are recorded. You get the video and the audio uh, on the uh, wenster.org site, and also on our YouTube page, there's playlists for these various um, collection of songs I've written over the years. And uh, so um, that's, uh, I think that's about it. Also, a almost almost all it. <laughs> we have our class schedule. It's Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you'd like to give to the ministry, we could really use it, like all ministries, especially now with the economy in the tank. <laughs> and of course, everybody forgets about the ministry. You know, they, they go worried about themselves and then they forget about, you know, how's your church going to survive? So, and, uh, but, you know, that's what we signed, as I said in my, Good friend Jim Ricard, who I got ordained with, that's what we signed up for. <laughs> Sometimes I ask myself, did I really sign up for this? <laughs> I'm glad I did. Anyways, uh, so uh, you, you can write a check to us at Winston Bible Ministries, uh, P.O. Box 541, Norwood, Massachusetts, 02062. Or you can go to our Winston.org site and go to the Donate tab on our homepage and click on that and you can get to PayPal. So uh, thank you for those who are supporting this ministry, not only with their financial support, which is very needed, much needed now, but also um, with uh, praying for us and uh, take, watching these classes and listening to them and whatnot. So thank you for all of, all of you. And, uh, and so I think that's about it for the announcements. <laughs> I really don't like to give announcements, but I have no choice. I used to have, when I was in, uh, in Iowa, when Prairie View, I used to have somebody come up and do that. It was great. My, Mike Wolf used to do it. Who's since gone home to be with the Lord, and some other people did. But uh, and in uh, in Mary and Iowa, it was just me. So and uh, anyways, because it was just a house church. So but anyway, so uh, I think that's about. Oh, also, um, I almost forgot again. Um, uh, we um, I've been down. I've been, as many of you know that followed the ministry, I've been uh, I was invited down to Doctrinal Bible Church in Huntsville, Alabama. The pastor there is Buddy Peak. And um, so I was down there for a second time. Uh, was it last week? Was it two weeks ago? When, when was it? So um, so I, was, I went down there. It was the twenty, the weekend of the twenty second. So that was last weekend, wasn't it? So um, and uh, so we we're, we're been talking about me um, going down there and, and taking over for Buddy. He wants to step down because of uh, health issues and stuff he has. So um, and he's a great guy. I get to talk to him and his his son, uh, who's uh, the head deacon there, Bert and stayed with him and his wife. They were very, very generous, very hospitable people, great people, and I really enjoyed the, the, the board there. I met with the board again, and so uh, good, 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 good bunch of guys, and uh, I, and so I, I'm, we're just talking about some things, and so uh, I'll let you know once they have their meeting with each other that uh, uh, what's the next step here, so. Um, and again, as I've been saying to people who are following Winston Bible Ministries, um, if I do end up becoming the pastor down there, um, Western Bible Ministries is still going to continue. That doesn't go away. Um, and so that's, uh, so the only thing will change is probably the, the schedule. So I could see us staying as Tuesday and Thursdays mornings at 11 a.m., but the Sunday class will have to be either bumped up to a Saturday or make it later in the day Sunday, maybe Sunday night. I don't know. Um, but because I'll be teaching on Sunday mornings over there if I do go there and, uh, and also, I like to, they asked me about Wednesday and I like to do Wednesday as well. So, uh, so that would be, uh, and so don't worry about 
you know, far as the workload, I mean, I for I in Iowa for years, I did uh, basically what I'm what I would be doing if I went down to Alabama. I've been doing it for long. People don't realize I've been doing it. Anyway, I've taught four times a week, so if I teach four times a week, no big deal. Um, uh, so it's not. Uh, it's basically what I'd be doing in Iowa. Same kind of workload. So in fact, I. I've you know, smartened up, actually, I, I can make it, instead of two different studies, I used to do a study for Sunday crowd, but I, and uh, and then um, one for the weekday crowd, but uh, I don't do that anymore. I haven't done that since last year. There's no need for it right now. But um, So, exciting times, so keep keep it in prayer. Keep them keep them down in, uh, in prayer, Dr. Bible Church, Buddy Peak, and also uh, Pastor Peak, and also myself, and uh, that, the, that the Lord's will be done. And uh, so... I'll let you know what goes on. So uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer. All those announcements out of the way. Hopefully I haven't forgotten any. Why don't you write these things down, Pastor Bill? Because I don't like to. I keep them in my head. <laughs> if I can remember a Greek paradigm, I can certainly remember the announcements. <laughs> All right, let's take a moment of silent prayer. This is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father, because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, he, God, the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, he purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. Now, we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which he's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5, 18, to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3, 16, to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your word. We thank you so much for those who are joining us live or through the recordings at a later date. I thank you for each and every one of them, whether they're your children or they're not, as of yet. And uh, I just thank you for the technology. Thank you for the streaming uh, vid uh, streaming video by, provided by YouTube. Thank you for them. And I just thank you, Father, for the technology and the people taking advantage of it. And I pray it would function properly and there'd be no problems with the recordings, the video and the audio, and upload these things to our various websites and podcasts and media platforms and protect them all from the evil one, Father, and use them mightily, please. I also pray uh, for, thank you, Father, for uh, your work on our behalf, behalf in eternity past and electing us and predestinating us to be conformed to the image of your Son. We thank you, Father, for the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and, and session of your Son, Jesus Christ, at your right hand, which delivered us from eternal condemnation, uh, spiritual and physical death, enslavement to sin and Satan, his cosmic system, personal sins, and uh, condemnation from the law. We thank you for this great, sal so great salvation that you provided for us through the, the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, from regeneration to resurrection. We thank you for the fact that he's identified us with your son and those events in his life through the baptism of the Spirit. And now that you look at us, not according to our sins and transgressions, but according to your, who your son is. And what he did for us. And we thank you for the fact that we've got the victory over sin and Satan positionally. And also in a perfective sense when we're, our, when, our, when we're going to be in our resurrection bodies. And also we can experience it now in time, Father. And help us to do that by appropriating by faith our union identification with your son. And considering ourselves dead to the sin nature. And the cosmic system of Satan and alive to you. And we just thank you for the fact that we can get rewards for faithful service. And help us live our lives in light of the imminent return of your son, Jesus Christ, at the rapture or our death, which is also imminent, and help us to live our lives in a manner that's pleasing to you. Help us to maintain our priorities and not fall in love with the things of the world as your word has uh, prohibited us from doing in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Father, I pray today that by the power of the Spirit, help me to communicate your full counsel today to your people with regards to this verse, Jude 7, and to do so with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power, so I can minister to your people and any unsaved that might be in the audience. I also pray, Father, that you would work mightily and powerfully through your people, help them to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction, along with myself, help them by the power of the Spirit to learn, understand, enjoy, and apply correctly what they're being taught. And I also pray for the non-Christian that uh, might be in the audience. We thank you for them, and we pray that they would be able to, through the power of the Spirit, understand the gospel so that they can make a decision to either accept or reject your Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. And we know that you desire 
all people to be saved and come to an experiential knowledge of the truth. So Father, we pray for these things and people in, our, in this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. If you could, and uh, if you haven't turned there already, please go to Jude verse 1. Jude verse 1, we're going to continue our study of Jude 7. And uh, if you look on the board, I had a little outline as we've been do showing you in recent cl previous classes with regards to Jude 7, because like Jude 6, we, we're doing this verse in six uh, uh, six hours, six lessons, and the reason why is because of the content in both verses. And we pointed out in previous classes that we, in the first class that we studied on Jude 7, we noted the structure of Jude and its relationship with Jude 6. And then uh, on the second hour, we noted that the rebellion of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, which this verse talks about, verse 7. And then we noted uh, on um, Thursday, the declarative statement that's in verse 7. And then today, we'll be looking at the three causal participial clauses in Jude 7. And then on Tuesday, we'll be noting the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them are now, at this time, experiencing eternal condemnation. And then our sixth and final hour of study in this verse, we'll be noting the emphasis of Jude 7. So, uh, let's look at Jude verse 1. And I'll be reading from the Net Bible. Look at Jude verse 1. We'll read the first seven verses, and then uh, we'll be looking at verse 7 in detail uh, after we, uh, we're looking at verse 7 in detail for the rest of the class, of course. So look at Jude 1. It says, From Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, wrapped in the love of God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be lavished on you. Dear friends, although I've been eager to write to you about our common salvation, I now feel compelled instead to write to encourage you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men have secretly slipped in among you who long ago were marked out for the, the condemnation I'm about to describe. Ungodly men who have turned the grace of our God into a license for evil and who deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, even though you've been fully informed of these facts once for all, that Jesus, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, later destroyed those who did not believe. You also know that the angels who did not keep within their proper domain, but abandoned their own place of residence, he is kept in eternal chains in utter darkness, locked up for the judgment of the great day, the great white throne judgment. So also, verse 7, Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns, since they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire in a way similar to these angels, are now displayed as an example by suffering the punishment of eternal fire. If you could, let's look at my translation of, actually of verses 3 through 7 on the board. Beloved, although I prepared myself with utter diligence to communicate in writing for the benefit of each and every one of you regarding our common salvation, I have entered into the state of experiencing compulsion to communicate in writing for the purpose of exhorting and encouraging each and every one of you at this particular time to make it your habit of exerting intense effort for your own benefit on behalf of the faith, the Christian faith, which has been delivered once and never again for the benefit of the saints. Here's why they need to do this. For certain people have joined all of you surreptitiously with evil intent, specifically those who long ago are written about beforehand with regards to the same type of judgment I'm about to describe, who are ungodly, who are exchanging experiencing the grace of our God for practicing criminal behavior. Consequently, they're refusing to follow the one and only master, namely our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I am prompted to desire to cause each and every one of you to be reminded, even though each of you are possessing a thorough knowledge about each of these examples, that Jesus, sometime after having delivered the people out from the land that is Egypt, destroyed those who would not believe the Exodus generation and those members of the Exodus generation that died the sentence of death because they were in unrepentant apostasy. Verse 6, correspondingly, he is keeping by means of eternal chains under the control of total supernatural darkness for the purpose of executing the judgment during the great day of those who entered into the state of not keeping their own sphere of activity, but rather, in fact, abandon their own place of habitation. As we pointed out in great detail, that's speaking of the, the, the Genesis 6, 1 through 8 angels, the Baraha Elohim, the sons of God, who uh, basically... Uh, in, um, in, um, possess the bodies of unregenerate human men, unregenerate men, in order to have sex with unregenerate women, and the result was not half men, half angels, but the Nephilim, because the text of Genesis says they were human beings, not half men, half angels. And the reason why Satan wanted to do this is to prevent the incarnation of the Son of God by corrupting the, beha the, the behavior 
of the human race, so much so that God would prompt God to judge them. And that's exactly what he did, except, as we've been pointing out, Noah and his family believed in the Lord and they were spared, thus continuing the human race. And so, uh, and Satan knew this, uh, Genesis 3.15, that the Lord's uh, intention was to destroy the works of the devil through the incarnation of the, of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So that's what we noted in great detail. Now we have verse 7, similarly, in a manner, like these angels, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, caused themselves to be publicly set forth as an example. As we pointed out, that's as an example in Scripture because uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are buried underneath the Dead Sea in the southeast portion of it. Then it says in verse, uh, the rest of the verse, namely, uh, in, in ex- the next uh, clauses, participial clauses, explain the, the, the reason why they are set forth as an example, namely because they're experiencing a righteous punishment which is experiencing eternal fire because they committed immorality, specifically because they pursued after homosexual activity. Now, uh, for those who might be new to this study, because I have a lot of people uh, coming into this study because of the internet. Now, in context, what we're looking at here with the Epistle of Jude, this epistle, as we pointed out, was penned in approximately between 62 and 66 AD after the death of James, who's Jude, who's Jude's brother. And the, both of them were the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. And we saw that uh, this is just prior, this was written just prior to the war uh, that the Jews had with the Roman Empire in 66 to 70 AD, which Josephus notes in great detail in his great work, War of the Jews. And the, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus and the Roman legions, and also the city of Jerusalem, and the people deported throughout the Roman Empire, and also into the city of Rome, they, we have uh, the Arch of Titus today. You can go there. The artist has a, 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 a rendition of the triumphal procession of Titus when he came back into Rome with the Jewish captives. And so this was a, a fulfillment to the, of the Lord's prophecy in the, on his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Daniel 20, 9, 26 also predicted the destruction, the demise of Jerusalem and the temple. And uh, we saw that... Uh, that uh, this particular decade, uh, the 60s of the first century AD, was tumultuous uh, because of a group of individuals called the Zealots. These unregenerate Jewish Zealots were um, provo- uh, basically uh, the, 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 the leaders in this revolt against Rome. They were one of the four great pillars of Jewish society in the first century AD. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, as we can see from the Gospels, and then you have the, the Essenes down in the Dead Sea area, and then you had the Jewish Zealots, who uh, came about, according to Josephus, from uh, a man named uh, Judas the, Na- uh, the Galilean. He, he, he was killed by the Romans. And uh, they, this group of individuals were um, believed in the sole rule of God. And, uh, and they believed in the sole rule of God, and meaning that they didn't have to obey the, uh, the Roman emperor at that time, Vespasian. And uh, they believed that God was the only one they should obey. And they, so they didn't recognize the, the Jewish, uh, the Roman civil authorities. Uh, these individuals also were zealous for the law. Uh, they were pretty much, they took a lot of what they did uh, in the first century from the second century BC with the Maccabeans and those who studied Daniel with me, Daniel 11 in particular, the Maccabeans were zealous for the law and they wanted to keep Jewish society free from the influence of Greek uh, language and culture and religion. And uh, they were the ones who rebelled against Antiochus Epiphanes IV and they were successful. Uh, the first, second, third Maccabees document their uh, exploits. And so these Jewish uh, zealots in the first century AD and, and Jude's time uh, were the uh, individuals who were f- trying to be like them in a lot of ways. And uh, they also believed in the book of Daniel. Obviously, they, they interpreted Daniel uh, chapter 7 in the fourth beast correctly as being Rome. However, they failed to realize that the ten horns and the, the little horn, which depicts the Antichrist, uh, it would be during that period in which Antichrist in the final stage of the Roman Empire around that the Messiah would come back. And so they didn't interpret that at all uh, correctly. So that's why they did what they did. So they were, and this is interesting, I believe, and I talked about this in the book of Daniel. I think the book of Daniel, the, the uh, Jewish leaders after the demise of uh, Jerusalem in the temple in 70 AD, uh, they flipped, uh, they, they would put uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel under the, um, the historical books rather than um, in the prophetic books. Uh, because it always, the book of Daniel seemed to prompt an uprising among the Jewish people. And uh, so we see that uh, this book is all about the, 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 the description of the individuals, the opponents in Jude, are these unregenerate Jewish zealots. 
Uh, this is indicated by the text also, uh, obviously. Uh, the, the text, we see that these three examples uh, of the Exodus generation and the fallen angels of Genesis 6 and the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them are all examples in the Old Testament of God judging people who rebelled against him. And that's key, rebelling. It's not about the sexual sins of these individuals because the Exodus generation, there was unbelief, unrepentant unbelief was the reason why God judged them, these apostate believers in, in Israel. And then the, 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 the sons of God, the Benaha Elohim, they were, they, had, uh, they were possessing the bodies of unregenerate men to have sex with unregenerate women in order to corrupt the, the character of the human race and prompt God to dis destroy the human race. And, uh, and then the, uh, so then they had the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the, of course they, it says here in the text that there was homosexuality. But not all these examples are, are related to, and, and in fact all their sins are different from each other. Homosexuality was not the, the problem with the fallen angels, and uh, it was just with the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was not the problem of the Exodus generation. So the rebellion here, uh, the fact that, that God gives the uh, the recipients of this letter, who are the the Christian community in Judea, these three examples as to uh, you know just why they should stay away these from the, and reject the the uh, the um, the Jewish zealots trying to get them to join the rebel against Rome, rebellion against Rome, is that uh, these examples are people because God's going to judge these individuals like He did these three different groups in the Old Testament that are found listed for us in verses 5, 6, and 7 of the epistle of Jude. And then also uh, we see that when we get to verse, we talk about uh, in verse 9 with Michael and the elect, the elect angel and, uh, not uh, making a slanderous accusation against Satan. Uh, that's because they didn't, uh, Satan, uh, Michael didn't do that because he respected the authority of Satan, which was, te he had temporary authority over the human, over the, uh, the human race. And uh, so that's another indication, that verse is another indication that we're talking about these unregenerate Jewish zealots and not false teachers, as we pointed out. There's no explicit reference to these people being false teachers. Uh, there's no, in, can, uh, there's no uh, description of the nature of their teaching, which we would expect, as we got with uh, 1 John, where John calls the opponents Antichrist, and then he describes the nature of their teaching, which is not uh, to set agnosticism. Uh, they're not the Judaizers, because the Judaizers were uh, believers, Jewish believers are trying to get Gentile believers in the church to obey the law. And of course, Acts 15 says they didn't have to do that. And so we don't see that here, because these people are unregenerate. They, 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 Described, described as being unsaved people uh, in several different places in the letter. And in fact, right off the bat, in verse 3, they're called ungodly. And then so, uh, this is the situation. These unregenerate Jewish zealots had surreptitiously, they were going into the meetings, the Christian meetings, trying to persuade the Christians to join them in their revolt against the Roman Empire in order to bring in the kingdom of God, because they wanted the kingdom of God on the earth, and they thought that they had to rebel against the Gentiles, the Romans, to bring to cause the Messiah to come back. And of course, that was an against Christian teaching. That's why Jude says what he says, to contend for the Christian faith in verse 4, because in that aspect of the Christian faith that they needed to defend was the second advent to Christ and also the doctrine of the apostles in Jesus that they were to respect the governmental civil authorities. Romans 13, we pointed out in 1 uh, Peter chapter 2. And then, uh, remember the second advent, Jesus Christ will bring in the, 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 uh, the kingdom of God on earth, and he will do this by his own doing, by the exercise of his divine omnipotence. We know that from Zechariah 12 and 14, those chapters, and of course, uh, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, and also Revelation 19 and 20. So the, the therefore the Judaizers, or not the Judaizers, the, these Jewish zealots uh, were going contrary to Christian teaching, and the, the, teaching the apostles and Jesus and the Old Testament. So that's the context in which we're studying Jude 7 here today. So uh, if you look on the board today, uh, on, on the board with my notes, we see that, uh, as we noted uh, earlier, Jude 7 is built around a declarative statement. And that declarative statement is this. Uh, similarly, in a manner like these angels, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, caused themselves to be publicly set forth as an example. And the cause of the middle voice of the verb there, prokamai, uh, is, uh, is, sp is speaking of the volitional responsibility of these uh, these uh, citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them, Adma, Adma and Zeboim, as we pointed out. And so this verse, Jude 7, is built around 
this declarative statement, which I re just read to you, which we noted, asserts that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them in a similar manner, like the fallen angels mentioned in Jude 6, caused themselves to be publicly set forth as an example. Now, this declarative statement is modified by two causal participial clauses, okay? And I, here they are right here. And they're translated by myself as namely because they're experiencing a righteous punishment which is experiencing eternal fire because they committed sexual uh, committed immorality specifically because they pursued after homosexual activity so there's actually uh, three participles here in this particular verse uh, if you um, if on the uh, we have uh, first of all we have uh, the first one is uh, ek poruo and uh, we'll be noting that today and that's translated indulged in the net bible pursued in the net bible is uh, actually translating uh, the word ap ekomai. And then we have, uh, th then we obviously, we have uh, prokemai, which is translated displayed there. And so um, we see here that the, these, uh, these, uh, these verbs, are these, uh, they're in participle form and they're causal participles. So we see that uh, these three causal participles, and they're participial causal clauses, also present two reasons why the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, in a manner like the fallen angels mentioned in Jude 6, caused themselves to be publicly set forth as an example. Therefore, the first reason is that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, are experiencing a righteous punishment, namely they're experiencing eternal fire. And the second reason is that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, committed immorality, and specifically, they pursued after homosexual activity and so as they pointed out in the past um, the the, the um, eternal condemnation uh, uh, is, uh, is is a serious threat if you're if you're not a, a, a believer in Jesus Christ you're under eternal condemnation you could if you don't repent and trust by trusting Jesus as your Savior you will experience the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever and of course he desires you not to go there that's why he sent his son to become a human being and to suffer his wrath on the cross so that you and I, the human race, would not have to suffer the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever. Jesus lived the life of perfect obedience that the Father required because he's holy, he's perfect, and none of us is perfect. None of us. So uh, God sent his son so that he could save us through faith in his son. So uh, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were involved in homosexual activity. The Bible condemns homosexual activity. And, uh, and, and so they, and I had an individual, in fact, I, as I pointed out, they're probably responding to what I said. I had a, a, a person who was uh, involved in um, supporting, uh, you know, the, um, the, she was a lesbian, evidently. And uh, so uh, she was, um, you know, saying that uh, the Bible teaches that it, the Bible is, uh, is, uh, condones it, supports it. I was like, there's, there's, there's no, and then she's saying that in response to what I said, there's no evidence in, anywhere in scripture that God is approval, uh, approves of homosexual behavior or behavior, or lesbian behavior with women. He condemns it. I read you one of those passages in Romans and I could have gone to the Old Testament. People say, well, we use the Old Testament passages. Well, that's Old Testament. No, no, New Testament. I gave you New Testament too. And there's other places I could have shown you that, that uh, God, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 uh, it talks about that they will not, people like them and other people who are involved in different types of sin will not inherit the kingdom of God, it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In fact, some of the Corinthians, Paul says in that passage, used to be homosexuals or practice, practicing homosexuals. So, uh, of course, you're going to remember, we left off this as well, Christians must not ever, ever get into any kind of violent uh, activity toward these individuals. You're to love them. You're to give them, your love neighbor as yourself. You're to give them the gospel. And first, as I said before, you might want to befriend them and uh, be, you know, be friendly with these people, and then you know try to develop a relationship with these people. And of course, you don't have by doing so, you're not condoning their behavior. You're trying to reach out to them and show them there's a God who does love them and who can deliver them from this terrible sin. And uh, so, and uh, and all sin is terrible in the eyes of God whether you're a heterosexual involved in uh, adultery and or sex outside of marriage, fornication, or you're a homosexual. Uh, it, it's sin. It's, an, it's All sin is an abomination to God. Even lying is called an abomination by God. So uh, we must not, uh, you know, we must reach out to these people and uh, because that's what the gospel is for. It's for sinners like them and like you and like me. You know, our sin might not be homosexual practice, but uh, 
Our sin might be lying or being self-righteous and think we're better than other people because they're so immoral and we're so moral. Well, you could be a moral degenerate like the Pharisees because none of us is so moral that God would accept us based upon our morality because you'd have to be perfect and not even not one of us even lives up to our own standards if we're honest. So forget about uh, uh, living up to God's st uh, holy standards. He demands perfection. That's why he had his son, his son, to become into the world, to live the life of perfect obedience that we that he required and we couldn't do. So uh, very important we keep these things in mind and make application and start uh, praying for people who you know who are involved in homosexual practice, and, and, and lesbians or whatnot. You know, pray for these individuals and try to uh, at some you know, pray that you might be able to get an opportunity to eventually give them the gospel. And I, and I would say this too. Before you start hearing them with the word of God, get to be friendly with these people. Show them that you're not just sitting there going to try to, you know, turn them into a Christian. So, you know, try to be friendly with them. You know, they're human beings just like you and I. And you might not, you, 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 should, you, you, you don't have to, agree, again, agree with their lifestyle. But there, a lot of these people are very nice. I, I, I've told you before in the past, I've, uh, one, uh, one gentleman that I knew who is, um, actually with a couple of them. In fact, actually, it's quite an interesting. I used to play in this place. Uh, that with my guitar and sing and play different stuff and um, you know like Bon Jovi stuff and the Beatles and uh, so I, I would play that and I know there was one guy who was um, he was you know in, involved uh, you know a guy homosexual behavior practice and he's now married he married a, a, a beautiful brunette and he's now married and uh, has kids and I, I I didn't really he knew who I was and he knew I was a pastor and all that and his father was a Christian, but he's, you know, he's not doing that. He's not practicing that anymore. And there was another gentleman who was a uh, homosexual. And, uh, and I thought he was a great guy. I really, enjoyed, you know, we joked around and he never, never tried to make a move on me or anything like that. And, but I, it was, you know, so, you know, you, you got to keep that in mind. And, uh, and I know some people say, well, Jesus, you know, you look in the gospels, Jesus never, you know, he never was, uh, you know, giving the gospel to homosexuals. Well, that's because in Jewish society, you would be stoned to death if you, if you practice homosexual behavior. That's why. But Paul, if you read Paul, he went to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were immersed in those kind of sins, among other things. So, getting back to our text, after, we, after I just gave you a little bit of application there. Now, these three causal participial clauses in Jude 7 are also presenting two reasons. Why the rebellion of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, is similar to the rebellion of the fallen angels during the antediluvian period. So again, this verse, these three causal participles, and uh, in uh, Jude seven, are not only presenting the they're not only presenting the um, the reasons why the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and as and the citizens of uh, the cities around them in a manner like the fallen angels caused themselves to be set forth publicly as an example not to follow, but it's also these causal participle clauses which are three in number, are also presenting two reasons why the rebellion of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, is similar to the rebellion of the fallen angels during the antediluvian period, which we noted in verse 6. So the first reason is that both groups are experiencing eternal condemnation in Hades, which of course is the consequence of their rebellions. The fallen angels are experiencing it in Tartarus, while the citizens of, citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them are experiencing in, it in torments, and eventually both will experience eternal condemnation and the eternal lake of fire, according to Revelation 20, verses 10 to 15. And the second reason is that both groups committed gross sexual immorality. The fallen angels possessed the bodies of unregenerate men in order to have sex and procreate with unregenerate women in order to prevent the incarnation of the Son of God, the Son of God uh, due to the corrupt behavior of the Nephilim, who were not half men, half angels, but the the offspring of uh, the fallen angels possessing the bodies of unregenerate men and having sex with unregenerate women. On the other hand, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of uh, and the citizens of the cities around them were pursuing homosexual relations with each other. So back to this uh, this first reason that both groups are experiencing eternal condemnation. The fallen angels of Genesis six and the the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they're both experiencing eternal condemnation, condemnation in Hades, which of course is the consequence of their rebellions. And as I said before, the fallen angels of Genesis 6 are in Tartarus. We saw that with 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 18 and 20. 
and uh, you know, we have Second Peter two verses four and five. So they're in, in a they're in a, uh, a place called um, Tartarus, which is the prison cell of the fallen angels of Genesis six. At the end of human history, at the Great White Throne of Judgment, they, along with Satan, the other fallen angels of Satan, will have their sentence of eternal condemnation executed at that time. Now, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, who are unrepentant, unregenerate human beings, they go to a place what all unbelievers go to now, and will continue to do so till the end of history. They go to they go to a place called torments, and there's two compartments of Hades: torments and paradise. We see that in the book of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 16, with uh, Lazarus and the rich man. And so um, the rich man was, in, uh, the, was in, um, in torments, and Lazarus was now in a place called paradise with the Old Testament saints, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So uh, when a human being who is unsaved, doesn't believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, dies, and physically in that state, they go to this place called torments, and they're suffering condemnation, suffering the wrath of God there. And uh, and then, at the end of human history, they got transferred to the great white throne judgment, and their sentence of eternal condemnation is executed at that time. Now, the, the paradise, that is empty now, and that's where Old Testament saints used to be after they died, went to go after they died, and also uh, the saints during, that lived during the uh, dispensation of the hypostatic union, the first advent of Christ went when they died, they, they're all in heaven right now. They were uh, Jesus Christ at his resurrection, ascension, and session, the right hand of the Father, his triumphal possession into the throne room of God brought these Old Testament saints into heaven to be with the Lord. Now, when you die as a believer, you don't go to, to paradise. You go, you're absent from the body face to face with the Lord. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And uh, he said it in Philippians chapter 1, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'd rather be with Christ then stay here on the earth, he said to the Philippians. And uh, so uh, the minute we die as a believer, we're absent from the body, face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. The first person you're going to see after your death is the Lord Jesus Christ, not your grandmother or your grandfather who's a believer. It'll be the Lord. And why? who else would you want to see? I'd want to see him first, more than anybody, of course, because he's my God and Savior and my deliverer from the wrath of God. So uh, we see that... Uh, uh, the uh, the wrath of God is a very real thing, um, and the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah are suffering the wrath of God right now in the lake of fire. And God again did not want them to go there. Uh, he doesn't want anybody to go there. That's why again he sent his son to the cross, sent him into the world, become a human being, to, so that he could live the life of perfect obedience that uh, he required, God required, because he's holy, and also suffer the wrath of God in our place so that we wouldn't suffer the wrath of God forever in the lake of fire. That's why when you trust in Jesus Christ, you're identified with him in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of the right hand of the Father because now, as because of your faith in Jesus and your justification, your conversion, you are now under the headship of Christ. And you, used to, you and I used to be under the headship of the first Adam in a place of bl- a cursing. And now with, under Christ, we're in a place of blessing. So now, no, now, now we are experiencing the forgiveness of sins, freedom from sin and Satan and his cosmic system. Uh, we're, we, we're, we're, not, we're freed from physical death. There's no power over us because we'll be absent of the body face to face with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. The death, physical death has lost its sting for us. And uh, un, un, in contrast to the non-Christian who doesn't have that kind of hope. And God wants you to be, you know, the, all of the, 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 the essence of the human race's problems is sin and Satan. We're enslaved to sin and Satan. We're not in right relation with God. And the man who shot those children and who, who, who does, who, and anybody who's committing these kind of crimes, they need Jesus. Now, I guess they shot him, so I would take it, unless he's an apostate believer, and a believer in apostasy could do the same things as a non Christian can because they still have a sin nature. They'll lose rewards if they do such a thing. But if that gentleman was not a believer, then he is suffering uh, the wrath of God and torments for all of eternity. So nobody got away with anything. And by as the kids are concerned, remember the story with King David and, and, ba- and Bathsheba. They had a, an, a, an adulterous affair. She got pregnant. And the child died in infancy. David goes. He was, he was mourning the, the child being sick. But then when the child, they found out he was, the child was dead, he cleaned himself up and went to breakfast. And he wasn't crying anymore. And they asked him, what is going on with you, David? And David said, look at it. 
I can't, he can't come to me, the child, but I can go to him. I will go to him. And we, what's David? He is a believer. So that means the child would be with him. He would go to the child and where's the child? In heaven. So all the children that, were, that lost their lives in this massacre at the school and any child in history, doesn't matter who, who, what these, where these children live, if they're, they're before the age of accountability. Age of accountability means you're able to understand the issue that you're a sinner and need a savior and you can make that rational decision to trust in Jesus Christ as your savior, okay? That's the age of accountability. It's different for, diff for, for it depends on the, the person as to what that age is, the age of accountability. So these people, these children, innocent children who suffered uh, this being murdered are in the presence of Jesus Christ right now. There's trillions and trillions and trillions of ch children, innocent children who lost their lives in war or crimes like this, murder or starvation. They're all in the throne, of, throne room of God worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't worry about those children. They're children. That the, it's the people left behind. So I would say this also to the, and I've said this before, if you, as a parent, lost a child, uh, or you lost, and these, these parents that lost their children in this, this massacre, God the Father knows how you feel. I said this one time, so this woman lost her child, and uh, a teenager committed suicide, and, and, um, I said, you know, God, know, the Father knows exactly how you feel because uh, his son was killed by wicked people. They crucified him. And the, and the mother looked at me like, I never thought about that before. And her totally, it totally got her out of her grief. And I was like, I don't know where that came from. I must have heard it from somebody else because I always asked one of those questions myself. You know, the Father knows. He knows exactly your suffering. If you're a parent that lost a child, the suicide, the father knows, you know, losing it, you know, the, the, the grief. Remember, the father had to abandon his son for us. And, uh, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he had to watch his son get crucified by murderous individuals. And crucifixion was the worst form of torture in the ancient world. So the father knows. And listen to me. Those children, and all children, including myself, when we grew up, we're all sinners by nature and practice. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he was sinless. So, so the father suffered, you know, we, we, we lose a child, that child is a sinner just like us. But the father had to suffer the, the, the loss of his, his son. And yeah, you might say, well, it was only three hours. Think about this. Two eternal persons decided to have not have fellowship with each other for us, our sakes. And how, how do you think they value their fellowship with each other? The Trinity wasn't disrupted because of that, the, the son abandoning his father, the father abandoning his son on the cross. It's indivisible. And the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, God man, was not disrupted by the fact that he lost fellowship with his, his, uh, his heavenly father. It was the fellowship that was disrupted. Not the eternal relationship between the two. So how do you think they valued that? How do you think the son, the father values his son? So he knows. He knows the suffering. And God's trying to do, he did something about the suffering in the world. As I said before, again, all these people, all these kind of crimes that are being committed, everybody wants to do the gun laws. They, you know, okay, do that. If you did that, then what happens? There's other weapons people use to kill people. Okay? <laughs> it's just, you know, you're just looking at the symptom. You're not looking at the root problem. The problem we have, the reason why we have these things happening in our country and around the world is because we're enslaved to sin and Satan. We're under the wrath of God. Sin has deuced things like this. The only solution is the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus did something about sin and Satan. He defeated sin and Satan at the cross of Calvary. And when he comes back in the second advent, He's going to what? He's going to take. There'll be there'll be perfect environment. The curse will be lifted. Uh, he will have. Uh, will be in resurrection bodies, and all the fallen angels and Satan will be removed from the earth for a thousand years. And no unbeliever will be starting the millennium reign with of Christ. They'll be in torments, or they'll be in us. Yeah, they'll be in torments in Hades. So, you the the, the solution is Jesus. And it's not a political party or a new gun law or, or whatever you want to do. 
it's just not going to work because the problems we have in our country and around the world and the human race is sin. It's as simple as that. It's sin. So, again, back to my notes again. Uh, we see on the board, excuse me, I had to sneeze there. I didn't want to sneeze into the microphone. So these three causal participles, that are, uh, they're participial, they're participles, are also pre presenting two reasons why the rebellion of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, is similar to the rebellion of the fallen angels during the interdiluvian period. And the first reason is that both groups are experiencing eternal condemnation in Hades, which of course is the consequence of their rebellions. And the fallen angels are experiencing it in Tartarus, while the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them are experiencing it in torments, as I said, and eventually both will experience eternal condemnation and the eternal lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 through 15. The second reason, as we pointed out, is that both groups committed gross sexual immorality. The fallen angels, we pointed out, possessed the bodies of unregenerate men in order to have sex and procreate with unregenerate women in order to prevent the incarnation of the Son of God. On the other hand, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them were pursuing homosexual relations with each other. Now, uh, if you look at the text of uh, the Net Bible, it says in Jude, uh, Jude 7, So also Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns, since they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire in a way similar to these angels, are now displayed as an example by suffering the punishment of eternal fire. And uh, so these individuals are uh, suffering uh, eternal fire. I just want to get the, the, the word uh, hoop echo, which is uh, in here. Where did I put it? Oh, let's see. Yeah, there it is. So they have, okay, by suffering. Okay, see the word suffering there? In the net Bible, it's kind of interesting they're doing that. But uh, that's translating the word hoop echo. And um, my translation is, uh, what do I have here? In, similarly, in a manner like these angels, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, cause themselves to be publicly set forth as an example, namely because they're experiencing a righteous punishment. The word ex uh, phrase they are experiencing because they're experiencing is actually uh, translating this word in the Greek, hoop echo. So there it is in the Greek on the board for those who are interested. And this word speaks of experiencing. It means to experience in, ex in context, experiencing eternal condemnation in torments and then eventually in the eternal lake of fire. The word for righteous punishment, uh, decay is the word in the Greek. It speaks of punishment God inflicts upon an unregenerate, unrepentant sinner which is justified. Very important. So when God is angry with us, it's justified because he has holy, perfect standards and we don't measure up. And he hates sin. He hates sin and uh, he did something about sin at the cross. He, lo he loves us so much and he hates sin so much that he sent the Son of the Cross to deal with sin on our behalf. So the word fire there, which is the word pure, it speaks of the fire of torments and the lake of fire and contains the figure of autonomy, which means that eternal fire or eternal condemnation is put for experiencing it. And this word has the, is modified by the adjective ionios, which is, means eternal, and it's ascribing eternality to this fire which is experienced by the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities which were around them in the days of Abraham. Notice this, this punishment is eternal. Look at the Net Bible. It says that they're suffering the punishment of eternal fire. The, the word eternal there makes clear and refutes annihilationism. And we did a series on that. I've got an article on our website in uh, Webster.org and also our uh, Academy EDU website. There are people who believe that when you die as an unbeliever, you are no longer exist. Or there's some that also say there's a period where you you know you feel bad for whatever you did or, or you, and then you die and you no longer exist. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches if you don't believe in Jesus as Savior, when you die, you're going to experience the wrath of God forever. And it, it, we know this, many passages, but if you look at the book of Revelation, Revelation 20, remember Christ comes back at a second advent and he kills the false prophet in Antichrist and deposits them in the lake of fire. Then at the end of history, a thousand years later, after Satan's final rebellion, the Gog Magog rebellion in Revelation 20, we have the, the great white throne judgment where every uh, fallen angel and Satan and every unbeliever in history, past, present, and future receives their sentence of eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. It says there in Revelation that the false prophet and the Antichrist are still there 
after the millennium and at the, the great white throne judgment. They're still suffering eternal condemnation. And no, I've never found annihilationists who would, all what they have to do is they'd have to spiritualize or analogize the, uh, analogize the text of Revelation to say that, that there's, uh, that's, uh, doesn't refute annihilationism. They have, to, they have to make the Bible say something it doesn't. So, the participle con congregation of the verb hupeko, which is translated suffering by the net Bible and experienced by myself, it functions as a nominative of simple apposition, which describes for the reader or identifies for them that which the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities which surrounded them are experiencing, which compares to that which the fallen angels uh, experienced during the interluvian period are experiencing, that lived during the antediluvian period. So it also, it identifies for the reader why they are publicly set forth by the Lord as an example not to follow. Now the present tense of this verb is a customary present or state of present which is used to signal an ongoing state. Therefore, it is expressing the idea of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities which surrounded them as, as being an example publicly set before the entire human race because they exist in a state of experiencing eternal fire. In other words, they're presently existing in the state of experiencing eternal fire. Now, like the verbs ek pornuo and arp erkomai, the participle conjugation of this verb, hupeko, is, uh, functions as a participle of cause, which indicates that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, are publicly set forth in human history, in scripture, by the Lord, as an example, because they're experiencing eternal fire. As we noted, the third assertion which appears in Jude 7 states that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them committed immorality which is then identified as pursuing after homosexual activity. As we noted, this assertion presents the second reason for the declarative statement in this verse. So therefore, this would indicate that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them are publicly set forth as an example of those who are experiencing eternal condemnation because they committed sexual immorality and specifically because they pursued after homosexual relations. Again, there are consequences to the sins that we committed. In this third assertion, the verb ek pornuo uh, pertains to performing sexual acts which are forbidden either by custom or by law. Look at the Net Bible. It says in verse 7, So also Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns, since they indulged in sexual morality and pursued after unnatural desire in a way similar to these angels, are now displayed as an example by suffering the punishment of eternal fire. And so this, they, they indulge in the Net Bible is translating this word, this verb, ek pernuo. And so this particular word pertains to performing sexual acts which are forbidden either by custom or by law. So the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, there are sins that are forbidden. There are certain, uh, there are certain sex acts, all sex acts outside of marriage are forbidden. Let's put it that way. And there's, uh, people who are, uh, bestiality is talked about in the Bible. It's condemned in the Bible. Homosexual behavior, activity is condemned in the Bible. Fornication, sex outside of marriage, uh, is adultery. All these are sexual sins. That, you know, God, you know, God, people say, oh, you know, God doesn't want me to have any fun. That's baloney. He invented sex. There's sex has boundaries, though. And if you go outside those boundaries, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's only going to result in misery for you. Okay? So God's trying to, he designed sex for a man and woman to enjoy in marriage. And when you get outside there, there's where you have problems. Like people got broken hearts and all kinds of issues uh, emotionally from these kind of affairs that they have, or these acts that they get involved in. Guilt, tremendous guilt. And then they have diseases, sexually transmitted diseases and broken homes and children all messed up because of adulterous affairs. Sin is, sexual sins are, 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 are terrible and do, they, do they do terrible things to us. So um, the only solution uh, for, for that is believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior because he delivered through his, his death and resurrection, he delivers us from those sins. And for the believer, uh, we still have to battle these kind of things, these temptations to get involved in these sins. And to do so, we need to deal with this temptation. We need to consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God because we're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seed with Christ. And when we appropriate by faith our union identification, by doing this, we'll experience deliverance from those sins. Now, the participle conjugation of this verb, ek pornuo, functions as a participle of cause, which indicates that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah 
as well as the citizens of the city around him, I set forth in human history as an example for the human race by suffering the punishment of eternal fire because they, get, they were engaged in sexual immorality. Furthermore, the participle conjugation of this verb, ek pornuo, functions as a nominative of simple apposition, which indicates that this word describes for the reader or identifies for us what these cities did, which compares to the rebellion of the fallen angels during the antediluvian period. It also identifies for the reader why they are publicly set forth by the Lord as an example not to follow. And the word ap erkomai, ap erkomai, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is used in this passage. It's an idiom which pertains to being engaged in unnatural sexual intercourse. Uh, if you look at the Net Bible, uh, this particular word is translated pursued in the Net Bible. It's the word ap erkomai. And so this word, very important that we pay attention here, uh, the definition of this word, it's an idiom. It pertains to being engaged in unnatural sexual intercourse. Thus, it pertains to having homosexual intercourse. And so, therefore, it means to pursue homosexual intercourse or to pursue homosexual relations. And uh, so, this is saying, this particular word is saying, it's unnatural. And, uh, you know, uh, this is what Paul talks about in Romans 1, 18 through 32, as we read the other day on Thursday. So, it's if you look at the bodies of men and women, it's clear that it's unnatural to be with a man, with a man. It's just nature tells us that. What God created the bodies like that. They don't work that way together. But of course, the sinner who is deceived by sin and Satan, uh, these kind of activities are thrilling for them. And then they get, they, they're involved in uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, s sexual um, deviation. And, uh, and, you know, and, and we have, you know, with pornography and, and uh, it's made us as a culture very uh, um, insensitive uh, and, uh, and we objectify, like for instance, objectifying women with pornography. I mean, think about, uh, and, and, you know, the, the men watching these uh, pornographic films and then they're expecting their wives to take part in some of these things, these devious things that they're doing in these videos. And, and so they're, you're messing up marriages because, with this kind of stuff. And so this is a, this is a serious problem we have uh, that uh, is going on in our country. So um, we... we the only deliverance again is is the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can that addresses the problem of sin and Satan and the reason why we have these kind of sexual deviant practices going on in our culture now the word flesh there sarks is the word it pertains to the physical aspect of a human being in distinction to the immaterial soul and in context it speaks of the human body of the same sex therefore this word indicates that the people in which the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them sought to have sex with had the same body as them, i.e. they were of the same sex. So this word, sarx, flesh, is modified by the adjective heteros, which pertains to something which is different from the norm or different from that which has been ordained by God for members of the human race. As we pointed out many times, the norm or that which has been ordained by God for members of the human race is to have sex with the opposite sex. So therefore, this word heteros, which, uh, let's see, they translate, um, let's see, which is, where, I'm trying to find the word in the net, uh, the, uh, the net Bible where it's, tra what it's how it's translated. <laughs> You'd think I would have this already figured. Um, let me see, I don't see it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't see it in there. I don't see where it's translated there. Um, anyways, um, my translation, let's look at that. Because they're experiencing a righteous punishment, which is experiencing eternal fire because they committed immorality, because they pursued after homosexual activity. So this word heteros, uh, it's, it indicates that the people in which the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them sought to have sex with had the same body, which was different from that which God ordained for members of the human race. Now, like the verb ek pornuo, the participle conjugation of this verb, ap erkomai, ap erkomai, which again is translated pursued uh, by the Net Bible correctly, uh, this word is uh, functioning as a participle of cause. And this indicates that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, are set forth in human history as an example by suffering the punishment of eternal fire because they engaged in homosexual activity. And like the ver participle conjugation of the verb, ek pornuo, the participle conjugation of this verb, functions as a nominative of simple apposition, and this simply indicates 
that the, the participle conjugation of this verb describes for the reader or identifies for them what these cities did, which compares to the rebellion of the fallen angels during the interdiluvian period. It also identifies for the reader why they're publicly set forth by the Lord as an example not to follow. And lastly, these two verbs, ekpornuo and arperkomai, contain the figure of hendiatus, which indicates that the verb arperkomai is advancing upon and intensifying the verb ekpornuo. So therefore, the arperkomai is identifying the type of sexual immorality that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them were committing with each other. I, I bring out the, the hendiatus figure in my translation. If you look on the board, similarly, in a manner like these angels, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, caused themselves to be publicly set forth as an example. Namely, because they're experiencing a righteous punishment, which is what? Which is experiencing eternal fire. Why? Because they committed sexual morality, and here's where the hendiatus comes in. I mark it with this word specifically. Specifically, because they pursued after homosexual activity. So this phrase, pursued after homosexual activity, is advancing upon, intensifying upon this causal clause because they committed immorality in the sense that it's identifying specifically what type of immorality, sexual immorality, that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah were involved in along with the citizens of the cities around them. So therefore, as we close, not only are the three causal participial clauses in Jude 7 presenting two reasons why the rebellion of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them is similar to the rebellion of the fallen angels during the interluvian period, but they're also presenting two reasons why they are publicly set forth by the Lord as an example for members of the human race not to follow. Therefore, Jude 7 is teaching that at this present time, the unrepentant, unregenerate citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the cities of Adma and Zeboim, are presently suffering eternal fire. That's co eternal condemnation, and it's, they're there because they're unrepentant pursuit of homosexual relations. This verse is also teaching that they're set forth publicly by the Lord as an example for members of the human race not to follow because they're presently experiencing a righteous punishment, which is experiencing eternal fire, or in other words, eternal condemnation. And also, this verse teaches us that this rebellion corresponds to the rebellion of the fallen angels of the interdiluvian period because both groups indulged in sexual immorality. So, as we close here, in context, what, why, what is Jude verses 5, 6, and 7 talking about? Why did Jude put these three examples of the Old Testament of God uh, judging people rebelling against him? The Exodus generation, verse 5, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, and, and, and also uh, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. Why? Well, because of the, the opponents in this letter that Jude condemns, these unregenerate Jewish zealots who are attempting to get the citizens of Judea and members of the Christian community in Judea to join them in the rebel against the Roman Empire with the pretext of ushering in the kingdom of God on earth. And so uh, God says, he says, no, these people will be, Jude says in this letter through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that these individuals will be judged by God like these three examples in the Old Testament who rebelled against God just like these Jewish zealots are rebelling against God. How are the Jewish zealots rebelling, uh, rebelling against God? They're rejecting the Roman, the authority, the Roman civil authorities, and the Jewish civil authorities by rebelling against them. God put the the, the governments of the Jewish, uh, the the um, governmental civil authorities, are been ordained by God. Romans thirteen, okay. So you re by rebelling against them, you're rebelling against God, and that's why. And the, so these people don't repent. They'll like Sodom and Gomorrah. They'll be suffering eternal condemnation for their rebellion. Sodom and Gomorrah exam they they demonstrate the rebellion with sexual sins. Uh, the fallen angels demonstrated their rebellion by uh, possessing the bodies of human men to have sex with, through these uh, unregenerate men, sex with these unregenerate women. And then the Exodus generation, their rebellion was unrepentant unbelief. It wasn't any kind of sexual sin, which they were involved in, but that wasn't the issue with them, the heart issue with them. So Jude is warning. He's telling the, the recipients of this letter who are Christians, Jewish Christians in Judea in the first century A.D., that don't get involved with these Jewish zealots because they're gonna, if they don't repent, they're going to be judged by God like the Exodus generation, like the sons of God, the, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, and like the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, Adma and Zeboim. They're all going to be judged for their rebellion, the, like the, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is very, and what's the application for us? Don't rebel against the governmental civil authorities. 
unless you have biblical justification. And that's, that's the message for there. And also, of course, these Jewish zealots, they, uh, they rejected this, the doctrine of the second advent of Christ, which said that Jesus Christ himself will establish the kingdom of God on earth without any help from anybody else by himself through the exercise of his omnipotence at his second advent. These Jewish zealots rejected that doctrine. So as a Christian, if you reject the doctrine of the second advent of Christ uh, and you're unrepentant about it, you'll be uh, dealt with by God. And you'll be disciplined because you're a child of God. You won't face eternal condemnation, but you could lose rewards if you don't confess your sin and obey what God's word says. So we had a lot to say in this lesson. We had a lot of ground to cover. And so we'll pick this up on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Lord willing, let's close in prayer. Thank you for joining me. Heavenly Father, we pray that this lesson be great blessing to the body of Christ. Bring glory to you in your son, Jesus Christ, ministering to your people and any unsaved. We thank you and praise you for another day of Bible doctrine. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. The King of kings.